Thomas, what's up, man? Thanks for coming on the Uniweb interview show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. My pleasure. <laughs> I uh, Sorry if I scream too loud. I realize watching these back that I scream extremely loud, and I must scare people uh, sometimes. So if I scared you or... Uh, I mean, I'm a trumpet player and a singer, so I'm used to loud noises. So your hearing is gone is what you're saying. And I... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I sat in front of a snare drum for like four years. Yeah, that'll do it, man. I'm basically like a... I'm like a, a foghorn, just kind of screaming into people's ears. So, Alexander Thomas, you are an author. Your your current book that will be out May fifteenth is that is that correct? Uh, May third, May third, May third, um, will be available for pre order and that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The Magician's Sin. Yes, uh, it's a fantasy noir book about a grizzled wizard who comes out of retirement when his ex-wife gets abducted and he winds up uh, going up against the mob and against demons and against these old feelings he didn't know he was going to have to deal with and it it all comes to a big head i'm excited for it dude is this like john wick with wizards it's kind of like that um i always told people it was kind of dresden files meets casablanca that sounds pretty badass man I'm excited. There are a lot of bone crunching action scenes, though, so I guess Casablanca might not be the best. Uh, <laughs> about the best comparison. How did you? Uh, where did this idea come from? Have you always been into uh, magic and wizards and that kind of thing and fantasy? I have been. Um, so the main character in the book is actually a D and D character I created. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. For people who don't know. Yeah, I um, I created him in 2011, and I wrote this big 100,000 word book about his backstory before I realized that that wasn't the interesting story for him. Uh, -huh. uh he was better as an Obi Wan character than as a preteen figuring out what he was about. Okay. And uh, he's just sort of a collection of no uh, noir detectives, uh, Humphrey Bogart characters. Um, drunk wizards, <laughs> drunk wizardry monks, just all sorts of things. That's awesome. So, all right, um, noir detectives got it. Drunk wizards, help me out here. Uh, and <laughs> do you have some in mind, or are you just thinking of wizards when they, if they were to get drunk? Wizards, if they were to get drunk, but um, okay. sort of like the drunken master stereotype you see in like anime and other things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Um, that's interesting, though, that you were you wanted to write him as a younger character, and he just wouldn't he wouldn't play along. He was like, "No, bro, too wise, <laughs> too wise yeah. for this." And I realized that that was sort of it was sort of formulaic and by the numbers, and it wasn't really. I kind of wanted to write a story about what happens to the chosen one sixty years after he's not the chosen one anymore. That's really cool. I was I was talking to another friend about this. How we always write like the hero's journey, and then they they accomplish the goal and happily ever after, right? But we don't see like what the hell happens after that. What do they become? Yeah, he turned into a drunk, lot mean guy. Well, that's usually what happens, I guess. <laughs> it's the Luke Skywalker ending. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is this so? Is this? Have you created a whole new world? Uh, yes, so it takes place ostensibly on Earth, okay. but it's an alternate timeline in a fictional city. So it is set in 1933, as okay. we know it, but it's in a place called Titan City, which is an analog for Boston. But it's not, there is no Boston in my universe. This takes the place of that. Okay, very cool. And um, so when, you, when you're writing all this out, when you're creating creating the world... Did you make, and I asked this question on Twitter not too long ago, but like a magic system, I I got a lot of responses. I can't remember if you had posted on there or not, but did you create a, a, a whole a rule book for magic and how it works in the universe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My magic system is, it's very hard. It's kind of complicated. So magic is separated along the visible light spectrum. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay. And each of those wizards is able to do different kinds of magic. And that magic comes from a different emotional place, kind of like the Green Lantern Corps. 
in DC Universe. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so there's some wizards who are courageous. There are some who treat magic as a science, and the more intelligent they are, the better they are at it. Um, mm. The main character, Anton, he is a white wizard, which is a combination of all the other wizards. There's only ever been two of those in history. It's him and Merlin. And Merlin in my universe was an evil dictator who created Camelot and plunged the rest of the world into the Dark Ages. <laughs> Damn it. I'm glad you took Merlin that way because I feel like Merlin's got too pristine of an image. Yeah, I think so too. And he was the main character's mentor for a long time until he, you know, the main character was like, oh, that guy's evil. I should not do that. That's the Chosen One story that I was talking about. Okay. So do you one do that? day I might release that story. That's all just before this novel takes place. Are, are you giving like flashbacks into the, into that, that whole backstory? During the during the main course of this book, so all of those events are only mentioned in passing, but there are flashbacks in the novel that deal with his relationship with his ex-wife. That sort of showcases the city twenty years before the events of this story take place to kind of contrast what he lost and what the world was like, and now what he's dealing with in the modern day. Sure. Okay. So the magic. The way you have magic set up, basically anybody is able to use it. They're just, they're, I mean, in terms of like how they use it is different. Right. They have to be attuned to a specific color and that determines what kind of wizard you are. So, but not everybody in the world is magical. There's, no. there's normal, what do you call the normal people? Do you have a name? I don't have a, I don't have a word for them. There's a, there's not very many wizards left, so there isn't really a wizard society. Okay, I got you. And um, I'm glad you did that with Merlin, like I said. I actually, I was writing something, and I, I created Merlin as, like, a younger Merlin, and he was off in, like, China learning Kung Fu. It, like, this, oh, cool. it was, but, no. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a sleepaway camp for kids, but he thinks it's, like, this big-time, like, Kung Fu master, but it's, like, for little kids, and he's, like, a 30, 40-year-old Merlin. So he looks like an 80, basically. It's it's pretty hilarious. Um. <laughs> Yeah, it's really fun to write about the, the, the fantastical, the magical stuff. Um, now, is is this this is your first book that you're writing or have, have written? This is the first one I'm getting published, but I have written a couple before that were sort of learning novels, learning my process and learning how it all works. And they might not they might not ever see the light of day, but they were they were important for figuring out the craft. Yeah, because it does take some skill. And you talked about uh, publishing. Are you you've found a publisher, or are you? Uh, yes, I work with a. Uh, it's a new small publishing house called Kyanite Press, or okay. Kyanite, sorry, Kyanite Publishing. And okay. uh, they just opened last year, and I think I'm one of their first 15th or 20th authors. Wow. That's awesome. Did you go through the whole querying process and sending out letters to agents and all that kind of thing? I have not gone through that yet. I plan on trying to find an agent soon. Um, and my my path to getting into Kyanite is kind of strange because they have a they have a bi-monthly magazine that they put out called Kyanite Press. Okay. And they were looking for speculative short stories. So I wrote an Anson short story, the main character of my novel, and yeah. I sent that off to them and they loved it so much and they found out I had a novel. They asked me for the full novel. Wow, that doesn't happen a lot. That's pretty awesome, man. Yeah, no, my entire career has just been dumb luck. <laughs> well, that's okay. I talked to somebody, another author who's working on getting published, and he's like, dude, you'll find out that most of this is like absolute dumb luck. Like just falling falling in and being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. But I mean, I, you had, I mean, you've obviously you worked your tail off writing this book. It's not like, like I don't have anything to give anybody. <laughs> if you know what I mean, like if if it were to happen, I don't have a short story to, to to submit. So you did some, you did work. Yeah, I've been writing um, professionally for about eight years, but I've I've been a writer my entire life. I mean, my mom published my first book when I was four years old. There was a, uh, I wrote a book about dinosaurs and I did all the illustration and she sent it in to get bound and she brought it back to the house and said, "Look, your first book's published." It was cute. That's adorable. <laughs> did you did you know then that you wanted to be a writer? Yeah, I've, I think I've known pretty much my whole life. I've always loved stories, and I've always wanted to tell stories and break stories down and figure out what exactly makes them work and why 
we do that as a species and nobody else in the universe seems to yet anyway there might be aliens who do i don't know yet <laughs> there's no telling they're, they're they're probably out there so you said you're a full-time writer what else uh, besides writing books are you writing um, I do game design, so I do freelance game design for a couple of different tabletop role-playing game companies. Okay. Um, I've done work for the Mutants and Masterminds line for Green Ronin, which is a superhero kind of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh-huh. Um, they create supervillains and stuff like that, and I've worked in their editing department, which is fun. Um, nice. So you create stories? I'm currently working on a product called no, I create the characters, and I create the stats, and I send them in, and Game Masters can integrate them into their campaigns. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and I work, uh, I've done some work on some horror RPGs, like the Quantum Black game is a new game that's out. A couple of my friends put out sort of an indie-style publisher. How does it feel working on games compared to working on a book? They complement each other, I think, but it's easy to... It's easy to fall into the author mentality when I'm writing a game, and that's not that's not really the best way to go about it, because a game is a group storytelling activity, so you have to be open to other people's additions or subtractions from the story that you're telling. Yeah, I know. I, I know what you mean. That's got to be tough, though, right? Like, it was was it a hard pill to swallow at first when you first started doing it? Because I know. Writing, it's like, I don't want people to touch my work. I'm like, it's exactly how it's supposed to be. Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. It was very hard. Uh, I've been a dungeon master since I was 11 years old, and it was very hard for so off book, so to speak, when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I would have this great epic story planned, and then they would just want to hang out in the bar and talk to, like, a bartender all night. And I'm like, but I wrote this epic thing. Go do it. <laughs> wow. That's really cool. So, we, some of the some of, I want to know some of the characters you've created so far for these games, because it's it's got to be. I mean, with the, the the amount of you know superheroes and characters out there, it's got to be like, is it getting challenging to come up with something new and creative? It is. Um, I have a lot of my ideas stem from real world modern problems. I actually have one. This this is perfect. I have a character named Selfie who is a YouTuber supervillain. Oh, no. She, um, she is the synthetic entertainment life form for interfacing with electronics. And she is a robot that was created by a, uh, created by a young man who wanted to be a YouTuber and have a makeup tutorial channel. But okay. he didn't know how to program her to do makeup correctly. And then he realized that there were shaky cell phone video of supervillain fights that were getting millions of hits online. So he created, he reprogrammed his robot into a villain, and now she has these three automated drones that follow her around and record everything she does, and they can like live vote on what the villain's going to do next. And it's it's a very interactive, community based supervillain. That's interesting. Okay, so what kind of uh, what kind of character would she be classified as, like in terms of powers? So she- She's a robot, so she has, like, missiles and lasers and stuff. I think she'd be a good match for, like, a Spider-Man or a Daredevil, somebody at a more street level. Okay, cool. Have you uh, have you seen the show American Gods? I have seen the show American Gods. Or the book, too, I guess, Neil Gaiman. Oh, um, yeah. It, it, it just brings to mind kind of, like, how they create, like, these gods of television and the Internet and all this kind of thing. That was kind of what brought to mind. It's cool that you're using what's going on right now in the world to kind of create your your uh, villains and your and your uh, characters. I had an idea for a character. You ready for this? So I mean, you know that you, you know that saying the uh, step on a crack break your mama's back. Mhm. So my idea was this kid who is walking home from the mall with his parents one day and he's singing the song and like his parents so he steps on a crack and this guy comes running out of nowhere and breaks his parents' backs. Okay? <laughs> now, this is his origin story. Okay? And so now he's he's a, he's a backcracker, man. Um, <laughs> he's, he's trying to avenge his parents' broken backs if he had just not stepped on a crack. Um, it needs some work, honestly. I, I think it needs some work. But there's real... 
<laughs> I think there's well, real substance there. It's funny that you mentioned that because there are in the universe of the magician sin, there are these goblins who are in charge of making superstitions come true, and they're called no stitches. Thing. Like break, like stepping on a crack. Yeah, or um, if you walk under a ladder, they're the ones who are responsible for giving you your bad luck. Or uh, some of them live in mirrors, and if you shatter the mirror, it attaches itself to you for seven years. Just stuff like that. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty weird <laughs> that I that I brought that up because there's no other time in, in any conversation that I would ever think to bring that up. It's amazing. It's, it's why I'm such a great conversationalist. <laughs> <laughs> makes no sense whatsoever. You read people's minds. I read people's <laughs> minds. Yeah. So, what kind of uh, what kind of book? obviously Dungeons and Dragons has played a huge part in in your uh, creativity and your writing. What other books played a big big part for you and uh, what you're creating now? Um. So I'm a big fan of the Romantics. I really like Paradise Lost. I really like uh, anything that has a Byronic hero, like Tale of Two Cities. I really enjoy. Um, I'm a big fan of Dracula and Frankenstein's, um, Frankenstein, sorry. Um, but more modern, um, I'm very influenced by Grant Morrison, especially his Superman stuff. Um, okay. like the action comics run he did, um, in the late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, I, I hesitate to say I like Frank Miller. So you say you you're not really a fan of uh, Frank Miller? I'm not. I'm a fan of some of Frank Miller's work, but not Frank Miller himself. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. You hate you hate him as a human. I understand completely. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so what are, what are some of your favorite Superman comics? I mean, I know I see that you uh, want to be from Planet Krypton or trying to be a Kryptonian, right? I mean, I'm a huge Superman fan. Uh, there's a lot of good ones out there. Yeah, um, All Star Superman by Grant Morrison is my favorite story. Um, I do enjoy um, uh, Red Sun, the uh, Elseworld story where he wound up in the Soviet Union instead of the United States. Oh, I haven't, I haven't uh, read that one. See, I, I have, I've seen a lot of the, like animated ones that come from the those comics, but I haven't yeah. actually read the comics. Like uh, where he gets too close to the sun or something, and his cells get supercharged, um, and he ends up dying, and like he ends up going crazy and like killing those kids, or is gonna kill the kids. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think those are two separate stories, but yeah. <laughs> oh, they are. <laughs> okay, because one of them, like Samson and Hercules or something's in it, and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's All Star Superman. That's one of my favorite comics, and I did see, I did like the animated version too. They do. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of the Paul Dini and the uh, Bruce Tim animated universe that they created with uh, yeah. Batman the animated series and Superman Adventures and the Justice League Unlimited stuff. Yeah, they do an incredible job with those. Like, I love watching those. Those uh, usually, usually they have them out on like HBO. Or they come like I, I think they have them up for like DVD release too, but. They're fantastic. I love yeah. the story. I don't. Why don't they make those in theater? Why don't they make put an actual budget to those? Why do they? Why do you think they keep them as animated? Uh, my theory is DC doesn't have a guy in charge right now. They don't have a guy who can make good choices up at the top. Like yeah. Marvel has the Kevin Feige who is in charge of everything, and he's the one who decides which stories get greenlit and which what vision the unified universe is going to have. Right. DC, they've been basically at the whims of each director. So Zack Snyder has ostensibly been the guy in charge, but he's only worked on his universe. Like David Ayer was free to do whatever he wanted with the Suicide Squad. Yeah. And Patty yes. Jenkins was free to do whatever she wanted with Wonder Woman, and James Wan was free to do whatever he wanted with Aquaman. Yeah, and Wonder Woman was pretty good. Um, I, didn't, I hadn't seen Aquaman. Did you? Have you seen Aquaman? It, just, it was really good. I liked Aquaman. Yeah. The storyline was very similar to Black Panther. Okay. It was, it, so it was a little it kind of politically charged then. It was it was like Black Panther without the politics, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean I I love that Black Panther included the politics. I think that the superhero community in particular should be using 
the time they have in the spotlight to bring attention to some of the issues that people are dealing with in the real world. Well, that's part of the reason it made it so great, right? It was because it dealt with real societal issues and the, and the medium that people are paying attention to. And that's, I think that's exactly what it should be used for. Um, if you do it, if you do it, if that's all you're doing, then, you know, it might be an issue, but at the same time, so big, big comic book fan. Was it a lot of graphic novels and stuff like that as a child as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my dad was a comic book collector all the way back in the 70s. So he was always talking about different superheroes and different kinds of stories that I should be reading. He liked uh, mythology, too. So he's the one who instilled my love of mythology and history and guys in capes beating the crap out of each other. Is that why in the beginning of the book you wrote, Dad, you made me this way? <laughs> yes, that's exactly why I wrote that. <laughs> that's wonderful, man. I was hoping it was a good reason. I was hoping it was something good. I left it kind of ambiguous just in case people want to think I have daddy issues. It's fine. That's right, yeah. You got you to gotta keep, them, keep them guessing, man, for sure. Um, so I'm excited. I'm ex really excited to read the, this book. And um, I, I have. I guess I've got an early release of the first three chapters that I'm going to dig into. Um what are you working on at, for after this? Like, do you have a sequel planned? Or? I do have a sequel planned. Um, so currently I'm working on, the sequel is called The Titan's Gambit, and it deals with the aftermath of the mystical event that takes place at the end of The Magician's Sin. Okay. Um, there are a couple of Greek figures from Greek mythology who are running rampant in Titan City, and the superheroes who are left after everything that goes down goes down are there to pick up the pieces. Okay, cool. So there's a huge so there's a pretty big cast of characters that get involved in this storyline then. Yeah, um I try to I try to keep it pretty consolidated, but my goal is to build up to an Avenger style team up, if that makes sense. Yeah. So this book is the introduction to Anson the main character and Caroline is the other other co-protagonist. She is the female lead of the story, and she is... This is sort of her origin story to becoming a superhero of her own. Wow. So this could be like, like something that branches off in multiple different avenues for you in the future. That's my hope. Um, I'm hoping... And I like that in the universe I've built for Titan City, almost anything is possible. I mean, magic exists. There are... Some elements of super science, there are aliens out there, but they're not mentioned in The Magician's Sin, but there are, there is a collection of aliens who are going to show up at some point in the story. Sweet. But you also get, like, the demons and the gods and all, there's just, I'm sort of building my own Marvel or DC universe where just about anything is possible. That's really exciting. Have you uh, looked into getting any of your stuff, like, um, drawn or, or uh, have any graphics done for it? I do have some character art that's been done for a couple of the characters, and I plan on releasing that as we get closer to the uh, the launch of the book. I'm going to be attaching that with like excerpts from the characters' monologues and stuff like that to sort of help build hype and get people interested in the art design and stuff like that. Yeah, dude. Anytime you can see like a, a real life character, that's pretty. That's gonna be dope. And I got lucky. I mean, I I met a great artist at my day job. Um, when I was working for BarkBox uh, last year. And she's the one who did the art for the cover. Um, I don't know yeah, if you want to paste that in the video. Yeah, I can put that, I'll put that up for sure. Um, she's the one who did the art for that, and she also did the art for the various characters. So it's one unified style, and it's very unique to my specific story. Very cool. Do you ever think, like, one day there's going to be kids wearing Halloween costumes of characters that you created? Have I you ever thought about that? I hope so, but I'm not, uh, I'm not arrogant enough to assume it's going to happen. <laughs> but you still dream about it, right? <laughs> yeah. I hope someday that – I hope someday I am able to write a character that people can connect with and can – look up to or look down on and just learn something about what it is to be yourself or somebody else. 
what have you what have you discovered in writing and, and creating all these different villains and heroes what have you discovered a theme in in the creation of these people because there's there's something that ties them right all together yeah um it's partially snarky humor ties them all together <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> that's my that's right <laughs> um my one name. of the big one of the big themes I like to explore, and one of the things that sort of colors every one of my characters, is the relationship of power and responsibility. Not to steal Spider-Man's line, but there is um, there are a number of characters in my work who think that people with great power have a responsibility to use it to better society. Some people think that there's no point, that there's even one person with a bunch of power is never going to make a difference. Some people think that those in power should be in charge of everybody else. It's just, it's a relationship between exceptional people and the rest of the world, I guess, is the one of the big themes that ties all my characters together. Yeah. Well, the idea of responsibility in the real world is something I think that people people struggle with, and I talk about this a lot too, like taking taking personal responsibility for ourselves and how powerful we can be when we take personal responsibility for our own lives. It's yeah. like we can see that, and it, and it can become manifest too in in, uh, in our sci-fi or fantasy writing, where it's like when the, the character finally realizes that the power is not a curse, or it's like that it doesn't have to be the way that everyone thinks it's supposed to be. It's got to be the way that they embody their power, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um... I think that there is definitely something be, to be said for owning your abilities and figuring out what you are going to do with it. Regardless of what anybody else wants you to do with it, what anybody else thinks you should do with it, you have to come up with your own your own solution and your own path. Right. I mean, it's something the characters, do, the heroes deal with um, and throughout, throughout the history of the, the writing of heroes. It's like, how do they stay true to themselves and do what's necessary? And how do they reconcile that, right? Like, how did, and like Superman never killing anybody or hurting anybody and like standing up for the American way and all this kind of thing. And, and Batman being who he is, dirty and gritty, but still like being the ideal citizen kind of deal. It's like always, always playing on that fine line of what's right and what's wrong. Well, what I love about them is they live in the same universe, but they tackle the same problem in completely different ways. Yeah. And I love that dichotomy. I think that there's a lot to be said for creating a world where there are so many different avenues of opportunity and figuring out which characters are going to which characters are going to do the right thing, which characters are going to do the wrong thing, and who falls in the middle. Yeah. And remembering that nobody wants to be evil just because they're evil. Everybody everybody thinks they're the hero, right? Yeah, exactly. Everyone's the hero of their own story. For sure, it always it always it always blows my mind though to see Batman come out of the stuff he does. Like, I don't know how this guy is like fighting these incredibly super powered <laughs> things, <laughs> having money and being a ninja, man. <laughs> That's where it's at. <laughs> Freaking ninjas. <laughs> They're a bigger problem than people let on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's really cool. So um, I asked everybody this question, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, but in terms of legacy. Besides kids wearing, you know, the superhero costumes that you create, what uh, what kind of legacy are you looking to leave the world when you're done writing and all your your books are put away and the pens put up, man? Well, I really hope I can keep writing until I'm just gone and somebody else has to pick up the pen and finish what I have. <laughs> the pen falls out of your hand dramatically. Um, but I I want people to look at my stories and I want them to see real people who are dealing with real problems and overcoming their own personal anxiety and their own personal conflicts to create a better world. Um, I want people in the future to know that, yes, we are anxious. Yes, we are depressed as a generation. And it feels like the system is completely working against us. But we have the power to make that change. You know, it's not futile. It's not inevitable. And it will get better. That's awesome, man. That's a that's a great perspective. It's so cool that you're you're writing that out. And have has writing these stories has it helped you overcome uh, mental barriers and 
and things in the, in your life? Yeah, I think so. Um, my father passed away when I was 23, so almost five years ago now. Yeah. And uh, the whole end of his life, I was sort of just a screw up. Like I didn't go to college. I didn't do all of the things that I was supposed to do with my honor roll, you know, graduating with high honors and having good grades and yeah. being well read. I just sort of drifted around, sort of bereft of purpose. And the last five years, I have really, I've really knuckled down and I've tried to overcome that. You know, he didn't leave much in this world other than like me and my siblings, I suppose. Yeah. And uh, I want other people to know that no matter what setbacks you suffer, that you can do it. That's awesome, man. It's, it's an incredible sentiment, you know? Yeah, and if you think you can do it, you can do it. I mean, I've learned that it's not the water on the outside of the ship that sinks you. <laughs> That's profound, man. Yeah, it's the water inside. Yeah. And, I, and uh, it's something I, I, I've, I've struggled with a lot in my life. And we talk about personal responsibility. It is. It's like once we realize that the water inside of us is sinking us, if we just focus on getting rid of that and patching up the holes inside of ourselves, and we'll, you know, it doesn't matter what where the wind's blowing. It's like we'll still be sailing along. It's swallowing the bucket that's the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damn fuck. You got open wide, man. That's awesome, man. I, I really, that really touches me for real, like because. That that sentiment is something that that hits very close to home for me too. Um, so thank you for sharing that for one, um, and two, in terms of in terms of the writing of building a world, creating characters, um, having them deal with real life issues and and all this kind of stuff. What was the most difficult part about writing this story for you? So I I worked with a wonderful editor named Shirstein Naveen, mm -hmm. who sent my draft back to me after I had her edit it. And she basically told me to rewrite the last half. <laughs> Which was something like 60,000 words at the time. Holy crap. Yeah, and I've, <laughs> cut it down, I've cut it down since then to 77,000 words. The whole novel was that long. So I cut okay. out a lot of extra stuff. So um, before, you, problem, before that, it was like 120,000 plus words or 130,000 plus words? Yeah, before that. But that was too much. I overwrote <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but the um, the problem was at the middle of the book it kind of shifted from being a noir story to a regular fantasy story okay. they, um, they moved from Titan City to the island of the Amazons Paradise Island Okay. and at that point it just became like a traditional fantasy story and it sucked a lot of the a lot of the atmosphere and a lot of the tension out of the story okay. but one of the best changes in the story resulted from this rewrite. Um, I took the Amazons off of their island, and I put them in a hall house, which is a center for women who are in trouble in the city. And they operate chapters of these houses throughout the world, and that's where they find their new Amazons. That's where they find their new recruits. Wow. And it was a way to modernize them and put my own take on them that wasn't just, you know, Wonder Woman minus Wonder Woman. That's pretty amazing. So... Having your editor tell you to go back and redo half of your book was the probably one of the best things that uh, could have happened to you. Yeah, it was the most um, difficult but best. Yeah, I mean, and it took a lot of owning up to. I'm a new writer, and I might not know what's best. And there are people who have been in the industry a lot longer than me who have good advice and good insight. It's like you had, and it's another when we're talking about power and stuff like that. It's like you have to play this balance of ego, enough ego to be able to say I can write a book, and not yeah. so much ego to say that I know everything there is about writing a book. Yeah, you have to have enough ego to say they should chop down a bunch of trees and put my words on them. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I deserve my name on this book and in lights. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, people should breathe less because I have thoughts. <laughs> right. Hey, man. Some of the stuff I write, I'm telling you what, it's pretty good. <laughs> I'm so excited to read your book, uh, The Magician's Sin. Um, 
Alexander Thomas, it's been great getting to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. I know we had some uh, internet hiccups and whatnot, but thanks for sticking with me, bro. It's, it was a fantastic time getting to talk to you. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate that you're making a platform for new authors and independent authors to spread their message. And I'm happy to thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I can't wait to read your book, honestly. And, and anything I can do for you in the future, just let me know. We're going to put links to uh, um, your website in the description so people can find out more about you. Uh, Magician Sin, again, is going to be out May 3rd. Yes. May 3rd. Yes. Nailed it. Yep. It's going to be on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Heck yeah. Awesome. So it'll be available to buy in all those places. And you're going to be putting out, you're going to be dropping uh, graphic art and leading up to the, leading up. Yep, I'll be putting them on Twitter and on Facebook and on my website. So there'll be lots of places for people to see it. So if people aren't already following you, where can they follow you at? Uh, I'm at Twitter on at AlexanderWright3. Because I wanted Alexander Wrights, but then I didn't notice that it changed it to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I got Matt Whiteside 3. And they didn't... It's good. Oh, I was gunning for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going for that one, too? <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll talk to you later, okay? Thanks, Matt. Have a good night. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?